American military were trying to intimidate these journalists. They were saying, you know, you're going to be a target and everything. And the journalists were working overtime to say, look, we're here, we're, this is our coordinates, don't fire here. And everybody knew the journalists were at these hotels. That's why they were at these hotels. It was also known that if you're going to have shock and awe, you need somebody to record it. I mean, the one thing that they left out was the, they needed the media to fight this war. The war was set up to be filmed and recorded by the media. So there was this bizarre symbiotic relationship. When the awesome bombing of Baghdad began, what was shocking was the way news anchors lovingly described lethal weapons. They became boys with toys. Should they have used more? Should they, you know, use a Moab, the mother of all bombs, and a few daisy cutters, and, you know, let's not just stop at a couple of cruise missiles. <laughs> yeah, only Craig, I want to I, I see him use that Moab. Action to begin. CBS's David Martin at the Pentagon is following the planning and has the latest on a possible time. To promote its war, the Pentagon made media management a priority. Their strategy was sophisticated, clever, and almost always covert. Few media outlets exposed it. Most participated willingly for their own political and economic reasons. Pentagon strategy went beyond traditional PR, using marketing strategies and perception management. Administration officials likened their war planning to a product rollout. It was all to guarantee there would be only one storyline in the media and in the minds of Americans, theirs. A Pentagon advisor told me it was intentional. They knew that TV networks prefer storytelling to sloganizing. Their storyline became a master narrative, defining Iraq as the problem and U.S. military intervention as the only solution. Traditionally, propaganda is targeted at the enemy. In this war, it was smoothly infiltrated into the news, aimed at American and global public opinion. There are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. This platform is not a platform for propaganda. This is a platform for truth. In his war plan, Tommy Franks, the U.S. military commander, described the press, once known as the Fourth Estate, as the Fourth Front. He knew that a supportive media was essential for victory, and he cultivated one. This will be a campaign unlike any other in history. The Pentagon focused on winning the media war, leaking their plan to reporters they could trust. We knew the plan, and I think the military benefited as far as positive coverage during the war, because we knew what the plan was. So we reported that things basically were on plan, or we weren't worried when we got delayed two or three days because we, we knew overall it was very successful. Earlier, when the media pressed for access, Frank's team came up with the idea of embedding reporters. A former corporate PR professional turned Pentagon official ran the program. One of the things we did, it wasn't rocket science, but it was hard work. We took the same kind of planning and training and discipline that you put into military operations and put it into this aspect of the military operations. And Rumsfeld and Myers, being enlightened guys, had included people like me in the war planning from the very earliest stages. But Tory Clark got uh, major networks and news organizations to sign a 12-page contract agreeing to certain ground rules that actually kept the Department of Defense, public affairs people in the driver's seat. And you got reporters in with these young idealistic troops who really believed all the spin of what was going on. We were going to liberate Iraq that the reporters would overall identify with the troops and their reporting would be very positive. On the journey, or when we get there, any sort of incident happens, please keep calm and remain on the bus. We will deal with the situation, no matter what it is, as swiftly as possible. What or, or news organization are you with, Tim? Um, Sat Ainz, German television network. BBC. CNN. Los Angeles Times. Japan Broadcasting Corporation. I'm Gwendolyn Cates, and I'm here on assignment for People Magazine, and I'm embedded with the 200, the 205th Battalion, 165th. I was the only journalist embedded with a military intelligence unit. They were part of the 5th Corps based in Germany. And I was invited, in fact, to be embedded by this unit because one of the commanders had gotten to know me and felt that I could be trusted and would really tell the story. These are your atropine injector kits. Should you become uh, contaminated 
and start to feel the symptoms. Pentagon put the embeds through a training course, ostensibly to teach them how to survive, but it went further. Hold it on there, so, so when you pull it tight. Journalists were given exaggerated fears of chemical attack designed to reinforce the threat of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. The propaganda was also aimed at the military. It was a threat that wasn't there. Good to go. You look lovely. <laughs> I lived, ate, slept with the soldiers. And the bond that was established between us was very, very strong and very personal. And we shared the sandstorms together and the lack of food. And people talked to me about their fears and their children had left behind and their, their fear of death and all those things. Now that's a piece of equipment. So I became very personally involved with them as individuals. At the same time, I was observing this with journalistic detachment, but I did place their safety above any sort of journalistic responsibility I had, professional responsibility I had, and I would not have done anything to endanger any of them. What we're saying is, help us tell the truth. Unmentioned by most media, the plan actually betrayed an earlier agreement made after the first Gulf War that said, quote, open and independent reporting will be the principal means of coverage. The Pentagon signed off on that policy on March 1st, 1992. There's an interesting issue of conflict of interest there because one of the standard rules of journalistic ethics is that journalists should not accept anything of value from the source they're covering. Well, all of their transportation and indeed their very lives were being uh, protected by the soldiers they were covering. And how old are you? I'm 21. What's your birthday? 3rd of the 10th, 81. It's because we want to send you a birthday card. How do you spell your last name? When I was there, it's funny because I was not so much scared for myself. I thought, what, what will I, how will I be able to handle it if one of my soldiers dies or is injured? I kept thinking about that. How will I be able to handle it? The idea of embedding is essentially the Stockholm Syndrome. If you take an unarmed individual and put him amongst armed people, he becomes sympathetic to their cause. So the idea was, look, slap a helmet on these guys, stick them in a Jeep or a Humvee, head them in that direction, and let them do whatever the heck he wants, and he will become sympathetic to our cause. Many embeds did a conscientious job, but they could only provide a limited and ultimately misleading picture. The debate from the left and right about embedding from the left that these were going to be lapdogs of the Pentagon, from the right that this was going to be loose lips sinking ships, I think neither proved to be true. But we haven't had the debate about what the embedding process did to our understanding of the war. See, stay down, stay down. Far too many journalists were gung-ho about covering the war. Some romanticized it, seduced by the spirit of adventure. Others sought glory, as Canada's CBC explained in a stunning special, Deadline Iraq. During the war, no U.S. network ran anything like it. I think so many journalists have this fascination. Uh, I must do this, and then I can call myself a war correspondent the rest of my life. It's as if they've got a checklist of things to do in their life, and this is one of them. But they are absolutely not prepared for the reality. People didn't want to miss this war, and it had a lot to do with, with, with people's career. There was no question. This is a thrill ride if you want to turn it into a thrill ride. I mean, you can, you can go to places in order to get shot at, in order to have the excitement of feeling what it's like to get shot at. I mean, you can go play in the traffic, too, if you want. There were few embeds with the military planners, with the covert action teams, the CIA, special ops, or with the air war. The U.S. military units that did the most damage were covered the least. I mean, it looks like this was disinformation at the highest levels. Later, CNN's Christiane Amanpour admitted her own network muzzled the news. ...is all about. Yes, I think the press was muzzled, and I think the press self-muzzled. I'm sorry to say, but certainly television, and perhaps to an extent my station, was intimidated by the administration and its foot soldiers at Fox News. And it did, in fact, put a climate of fear and self-censorship, in my view, in terms of, of the kind of 
broadcast work we did. Talk about letting people know that ratings have gotten under your skin. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, obviously, and I'll let the, the news media defend themselves, but I promise you, 5, 10, 15 years from now, people who study these things will say, you never saw such real, you never saw such accurate, you never saw such hard-hitting coverage of military conflicts. A week later, CNN hired the Pentagon's media flack, Victoria Clark, as an on-air contributor. It seems the gunfire has been coming from the police station down here. I think a lot of journalists did lose courage. A lot of embed journalists did lose their ability to be critical, uh, to emphasize the fact that there may be problems going on here because they didn't want to be kicked off the team. They wanted to stay embedded, and I think that was part of the problem. Look, you do what you can do with what you're given, you know, and I did the best I could with my assignment covering the 2nd Brigade. I think overall, if you have, what were there, 600 journalists embedded throughout, um, that is definitely a plus. By and large, the people who were covering the story, who were there at the front lines actually doing the actual reporting, did an admirable job. They were doing what they were sent out to do. However, they don't have ultimate control. The control someplace else. The control might be back in, in Washington or New York or in Edit Bay in Qatar or Kuwait City. Once this war started, we wanted the United States to win. We got to know these soldiers as people, and we wanted them to be successful. If the Pentagon had an agenda, the networks had one too, and it went beyond attracting audiences. When I worked in network news here at ABC, I watched the closing of foreign bureaus, the downgrading of documentaries, the dumbing down of news. There's nothing like the scary threat of WMDs and a good war to provide the basis for action-oriented TV coverage. Time magazine's Saddam cover was modeled on an earlier Hitler cover. Bush was presented as the avenging angel. War is one of those action-oriented spectacles that TV news lives for and thrives on in a post-journalism era. All the networks wanted to have was a countdown to war. If you looked at every single network, it was virtually indistinguishable. 48 hours to war, dun, 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 showdown to Saddam. With encouragement from the Pentagon, the news networks fashioned their coverage to maximize production values, to make it exciting. Time magazine called the approach militainment. Journalist Robert Pelton describes how it was done. I was in some of the initial phone meetings between New York and the people in the field. And this was being set up like a movie shoot. There was a channel called Best of the Bombs. And this is exactly what it was called, Best of the Bombs. And every piece of good footage from any network would be tossed onto this feed. It's a satellite feed. So if you're doing a story about, hi, I'm, I'm standing in the middle of nowhere, and let's roll to the footage, you would have this feed that had only good explosions. Secondly, they, were told, they told people, take your camera off the stick. We want to have that cinema verite look. You know, move it around, move it around. We want to see where you are. We want you to walk and talk and make people feel that you're in the middle of something. This is true. A Defense Department memo urged military commanders to encourage action coverage. Quote, use of lipstick and helmet-mounted cameras on combat sorties is approved and encouraged to the greatest extent possible. If you were to pick a generality, they were there for the big story. And, and keep in mind that Iraq is unusual because in the early days of CNN, one of the most memorable images were people like Peter Arnett sitting on a rooftop calling the war like a football game. This is the sixth cruise missile to have come over our heads in the last half hour. But the entire population of the planet focused on one journalist. So this was a wet dream for any journalist that went to Iraq, to be in that spot for a well-known predicted war to happen. If you're the guy holding that microphone and that thing happened behind you, that's what you're known for. You're not known for careful research for, uh, you know, it's the face. It's all about the face. And where that face is, is the measure of who you are. So they were looking to get bullets flying, bombs going off, and that microphone and then face on TV. Freedom is a rumor. News goo, what we need to know. News goo, what we want to know. We've got news goo, what we think we know. Got remote control to choose the show. But the more we watch, the less we know. Ignorance grows on the spirit like a tumor. 
and that's what generates money. I mean, you look at who moved up the food chain in the journalism world over the last four or five years, 